our best. And if there's a way to improve it, I'll be there. But let us, at the end of the day, finally, finally, finally stand up for consumers and small businesses across America and say to the Wall Street banks and Visa and MasterCard, sorry, this party's over. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Mr. President. Uh, yes, the uh, Senator from Tennessee. Mr. President, thank you. I rise to speak about uh, the Tester Corker Amendment that hopefully will be before us shortly. And uh, I have to say, I just witnessed uh, uh, a great discussion of populism, and that is, you know, if, if an institution's making some money, let's take it from them and give it to others in the name of uh, fairness. And uh, Mr. President, I think everybody knows that uh, certainly there are a lot of tremendous numbers of small institutions across America that are very concerned about the Durban Amendment and its effects, and, and a number of small retailers. Uh, but there's no question, let's face it, the big boxes, my friends, Walmart, Home Depot, Target, uh, they have funded this effort, as he mentioned, uh, on K Street with the lobbyists. And there's no question that a lot of the larger financial institutions have funded uh, the effort on the other side. There's no question. But the people that I think Senator Tester and myself and you and others listen to are those folks that come in from our home states the small community banks and, and credit unions around our country that are very concerned about this. Let me, let me talk about a couple of things. Number one, uh, Senator from Illinois talked about the timing. Well, we've been trying to find some vehicle to attach this men amendment to for some time. And the fact is, the Senate hasn't done any business this year. I mean, we come in uh, from time to time and vote on a non-controversial judge, but we've been trying to find some vehicle to attach this to. We've been trying to do that for months. Secondly, the Fed, the Fed, the Federal Reserve, which has been asked to put forth this rule, they are the ones that saying, what you've asked us to do is not appropriate. I mean, they've testified publicly saying that the Durban Amendment is inappropriate. Let me describe what he just said about reasonable and proportional. That means that, Mr. President, if you went out and built a debit system, you invested in all the technology, the computers, the marketing, the fraud prevention, all the things that went into that, what the Fed can look at now in setting the price is after you've set all that up and you're processing millions of transactions a year, if you send one more transaction across the wire, what does that cost to you? After you've invested all that, that's what he's saying about reasonable and proportional. There is no way that any business in America could possibly operate under that scenario. Again, retailer after retailer after retailer has been in my office and said, we know the criteria that's been laid out by the Durban Amendment is absolutely inappropriate. We couldn't function. We couldn't function with that criteria, but we don't know of any other way of solving this problem. We hate to have the Fed involved in price setting. So all of us set out to try, many of us set out to try to solve that. And what we've come up with is, in fact, a compromise. And what it says is, okay, we, we agree the debit card industry should be regulated. We agree that retailers are having difficulty in negotiating with Visa and others, let's get the Fed to set the prices based on the, the cost of the transaction, which do include, I hate to say, some fixed costs in technology and other kinds of things, fraud prevention. The Fed has asked us to do that. Okay, it's not as if we're usurping the Fed coming in and making a rule. They've testified publicly that the way the Durban Amendment is written is going to be terrible for community banks and rural banks. I mean, I think we all know the senator from Illinois likes to use these larger institutions, but all of us know the big guys just get bigger, just get bigger when we do these kind of things and create hardships for the smaller institutions. And the fact that some two-tiered system was set up won't work. I mean, the FDIC has come in and said, look, you cannot make it work where the small banks and small credit unions are held harmless. It won't work. The OCC has come in and said, it won't work. Market forces will take over. This will not work. They're going to get crushed. 
The, the state exam, the state bank commissioners have come in and said the Durban Amendment, as written, is going to be disastrous to consumers. It's going to be disastrous to the smaller institutions with which we all deal. So look, uh, I'm not trying to carry water for either side. I'm trying to come up with a solution that's fair. I've worked with Senator Tester, Senator Crapo, Senator Hagan, Senator Bennett, Senator Brown, numbers of people to try to come up with language that hits that sweet spot. And the senator from Illinois is right. We, we you know, probably never developed a perfect law. But I think we have a responsibility when we know that something is about to happen that won't work, that is going to be devastating, I think we have an obligation to try to come up with something that meets the test of trying to be fair to both sides. And I think that's what this amendment does. Um, you know, the senator talked about all kinds of things being added in. The banks can't just add it in. The Fed's regulating them. The Fed will decide what is reasonable and proportional. The Fed will decide, but they will use all of the costs that it, take to actually, it takes to actually do those operations and the cost, which, which the Durban Amendment did not do. So, look, uh, uh, I think that this amendment meets the test. I know there are numbers of people that voted for the Durban Amendment in the past that have co-authored this. They co-authored this because they realized that the Durban Amendment was far too narrow, that the Durban Amendment didn't take into account anything but, again, the cost of adding one transaction on top of an infrastructure that you'd already built. No, there's no business that could operate that way. The, the presiding officer used to be part of a, uh, a, a weekly broadcast, and if all you charge was the incremental cost of that going out and being broadcasted to other television stations around the country, and that was the only cost you could get, there's no way that our presiding officer would have been known to America the way that he's known because there's no way that operation could have succeeded. This is a very common sense solution. And those people who supported the Durban Amendment uh, during this debate, even though there was never a hearing heard, Pretty major, pretty major issue to never have a hearing in the banking committee, but to pass at the height of the time when many people around this country were upset, rightfully so, with some of the larger players in our financial system. People have woken up. They realize that this is a really bad piece of policy, but if we tweak it, then the retailers still end up with a regulated market where they're not overcharged, and yet the institutions that are providing, this is a service, by the way, or people wouldn't use it. The retailers like getting their money instantly. People like being able to carry around plastic to pay their bills instead of cash. But what this amendment does is put it in the middle of the road where it's fair to the retailers, it's fair to the, fair to the institutions that are involved, and most of all, it protects consumers around this country. I mean, I think you've seen the letters that have been sent out as to what's going to happen to consumers if the Durban Amendment goes into effect as it is now laid out. So uh, the senator does a really great job, I know, in, in taking a few of these institutions that, that uh, no doubt uh, behaved badly and causing the whole thrust of this to be about sticking a stick in the eye of these institutions that have paid, biz paid bonuses and made bad decisions. But the fact is that this is a bad policy as it exists. The Tester Corker Amendment, with many other co-sponsors, is something to try to bring that in the middle of the road. And I just ask that each senator, please, just spend 10 minutes with your staffers and understand what the third round of revisions does Look at what a common sense solution has been put forth by the best of this body happening, and that is people working together to try to get there. And hopefully, uh, we can end up with a piece of legislation that we're all proud of. We can continue to have a financial system that's strong, that includes the many small players that we depend upon in small communities across this country. And we can also continue to have a vibrant retail industry that really counts on the additional sales that they get from having access to these types of transactions. And with that, Mr. President, I thank you, and uh, I yield the floor. Mr. President. 
The senator from California. Mr. President, I just wanted to make sure the senator from Tennessee knows that his amendment is pending. It has already been put into play, and we are on it at this time. I just wanted him to be sure he knew that. Well, thank you. There was some discussion a minute ago about how that was going to occur. I thank you for that, and I thank yes. you for your deft management of this bill. Thank well, you. thank you very much. Um, you probably won't agree with my position on your amendment, but I, I do know that my friend has worked long and hard with Senator Tester and others. I really appreciate all the time that you have put into trying to come up with what you consider to be a compromise. I do want to say this. You talk a lot about the Durbin Amendment. There is no Durbin Amendment. It's the law. The Durbin Amendment was included in the bill. It is now law of the land. So it is a question of saying that we should essentially repeal it or delay it. You could study it, whatever the word is, before it has a chance to actually go forward. I, I understand that. And I just wanted to say for the record where I stand on it is that you know, I have met with all sides. I've met with the retailers who were very strongly supportive of the Durbin law, and I have met with the banks that are fiercely against it, and the credit unions who were very worried that they are going to get hit with uh, a situation where they won't be able to compete uh, with the banks. And I have told them all the same thing, which is I think what's important when we pass a reform is to see if it's going to work. And if it doesn't work, I agree with Senator Durbin. We'll do everything in our power. And I understand that the Fed says, help me, give me guidance. I think there's a lot of guidance in the law. And I think every bureaucracy in the world would rather have the details fall on us. And I think the details fall to them. So I am going to be voting no on the amendment. I do appreciate, however, all the work and all the time and effort that went into trying to pull us all together. I'll say the last thing on the swipe fee uh, that I find compelling. Uh, the, the law was signed, the, the reform, the swipe fee reform that my friends want to delay was signed into law last year. It places reasonable constraints on the fees that Visa and MasterCard fix on behalf of the nation's largest banks. But here's the thing. The U.S. has the highest debit interchange fees in the world, and the rates just keep on going up. The average debit interchange fee in the U.S. is 1.14 percent. The average debit interchange fee in the European Union is 0 0.20 percent, and the average debt inter debit interchange fee in Canada is zero. So it's not as if the banks uh, are taking it on the chin here. I just feel, give this a chance to work. I'm not standing here saying it's the perfect law. As Senator Durbin said, maybe there was one tablet, uh, the Ten Commandments. Uh, but as far as laws here, they could all be made better. And it may well be once the Fed acts that, that we're not happy and we can move at that time. But I wanted to really... Uh, get back to the bill, the underlying bill that we're debating, which is the Economic Development Administration a reauthorization. And to thank Senator Inhofe for his remarks that he made on the floor about it, and his pointing out that uh, we have a lot of work to do here to create jobs. And when we have a program that takes a dollar of federal funds and it attracts seven dollars of private investments and many, many jobs, we ought to come together. I'll just go through a couple of charts here. The EDA is an efficient job creator. They just are. Um, in 2009 and, and 2010, investments by EDA created over 160,000 jobs and saved 45,000 jobs. A dollar of EDA investment is expected to attract, and this is a fact it has attracted, $7 in private sector investment on average. Sometimes it's $10, sometimes it's 15, sometimes it's four or three or two, but the average is $7. Um, the EDA project funding creates one job for every $2,000 to $4,600 invested. So you can see that the average cost of creating a job 
is very, very low in terms of the federal investment. This is terrific. I mean, this, this program really works. And uh, there were a couple of things that we felt we ought to take a look at, duplication, the, a way for a community to buy out the federal government share of a project. We've put that in the reauthorization. So we think we have really strengthened this uh, law. And again, I want to thank the Democrats and Republicans on the Environment and Public Works Committee. Um, I went through this morning uh, some of the programs in California. City of Dixon, $3 million for a water system created, is expected to create 1,000 jobs and leverage $40 million in private investment. $3 million attracting $40 million in private investment. Um, City of Shafter, $2 million for sewer and water. It's going to develop uh, an additional 600 acres to en enable continued growth of the East Shafter Logistical Center and expected to create 1,400 jobs and leverage $253 million in private investment. In San Jose, $3 million for the renovation of the, uh, and expansion of the Center for Employment Training. They can then expand their capacity by 860 students, expand access to the GED, the literacy, language, and small business entrepreneurship classes to low-income areas. This is key. Absolutely key. I mean, it really should bring us together because they are training students so that students get out and get their GEDs, get their literacy, and can really uh, make sure that the community is growing and thriving. That particular grant is expected to leverage $3 million in private investment and 4,900 jobs. So it's a it's a one to one. It's a that case. It's three million of public and three million of private. Nationwide, I talked about this. I talked about um, other examples. I didn't mention actually. Uh, in the West Coast, in the Central Valley, 23,000 square foot water and energy technology incubator, and the incubator has housed more than 15 entrepreneurs since it opened in 07. They've obtained $17 million in private capital and created jobs for Californians. So $1.8 million attracts $17 million. Uh, we have a case of Boeing where they were able to expand one of their campuses. It created 2,500 jobs. And I talked about, Mr. President, to you uh, about Duluth. Uh, in 01, an EDA grant of $3.5 million matched by 2.3 million from the city of Duluth, helped build the Duluth Aviation Business Incubator at the Duluth Airport. This investment helped, is it Cirrus, Mr. President? Cirrus aircraft grow from a handful of employees to 1,012 employees by 08. The incubator is now leased to Cirrus Design Corporation, which has the largest share of the worldwide general aviation market. So when we're talking about the EDA, and we're talking about the, um, the way it attracts uh, private sector funding and, and, and creates jobs. This isn't hyperbole. This isn't just rhetoric. This is reality. And um, this is a program that's been uh, going on since 1965. 1965. And Republicans and Democrats have supported it. The last time it was authorized was when George W. Bush was president. It passed unanimously. So I stand here today on the opening day full of hope, full of hope, hoping that is not naive, hoping that we will see a few amendments. That's all fine. We don't mind amendments. Amendments are fine. But let's have reasonable discussion and reasonable time set aside and move on. Um, there's a case in the Maytag plant in Newton, Iowa. They, uh, they employed 1,800 uh, factory and administrative workers. It was closed down. We all know how painful that is. And we, meet, we remember back when we were losing seven, 800,000 jobs a month. It wasn't that long ago. Uh, by 08, the city identified two new manufacturing operations that could be located at that old plant. TPI Composites, Inc., a wind turbine blade manufacturer, and Trinity Structural Towers, Inc., a manufacturer of massive steel towers for windmills. EDA invested $580,000 in 08 
for grading, site preparation, surfacing for a wind tower storage facility that was leased to Trinity, created 140 jobs and generated 21 million in private investment. That same year, 670,000 to Central Iowa Water Association in Newton to help build a booster station, a storage tank to serve TPI. This project helped create 500 jobs and generated 40 million in private investment. On the East Coast in 2010, EDA gave a $750,000 grant to Seedco Financial Services, a national nonprofit community development financial institution. Seedco used this funding to provide capital to sub-zero insulation and refrigeration technologies, which is a family-owned and operated manufacturer of custom, environmentally friendly, energy-efficient, refrigerated, insulated commercial truck and van liners. Sub-Zero is pretty famous, um, and they locate, they, they're located in Brooklyn, New York. They had been denied financing by a major bank. See, this is the thing. A lot of our companies can't get, you know, while the banks want to charge very high, you know, swipe fees, they're somehow absent when our companies needed them. And in 2010, that's just last year, Sub-Zero was denied financing. EDA provided the access to capital, which allowed Sub-Zero to fulfill its contract with Edible Arrangement to outfit delivery vehicles and to win contracts in Ford, Chevy, and Dodge. This allowed Sub-Zero to hire 15 new staff starting in 04 with just three employees and producing 75 vehicles a year. The company has 20 employees and approximately produces 400 vehicles a year. It goes on. EDA provided $2 million to help build the Knowledge Works pre-incubator facility as part of the development of Virginia Tech. And now we've seen 2,000 high-wage jobs created and the inception of 140 high-tech businesses. The way EDA works, Mr. President, is there's regional offices, about six of them, and they get funded through the Appropriations Committee to Commerce Department. And then each region makes the decision as to which projects really meet the goals of the legislation, which is to bring economic development to distressed areas, create jobs, and leverage the dollars. So in addition to this, EDA in 08, we gave them an extra 500 million in disaster uh, assistance to, to, to give to areas which were experiencing disaster problems. And they assumed the role of a secondary responder working with affected communities to support long-term post-disaster rebuilding. Um, an example of that, again, back in Iowa, they provided funding to help construct and install an upgraded energy-efficient natural gas-fired boiler system following a flood that destroyed the boiler that had provided steam, heat, and hot water to St. Luke's Hospital and Co. College. And we all know what happens when a hospital can't count on a backup generator. They can't count on energy. We know what happens when that occurs. Everything shuts down and, and people are in peril. EDA steps in uh, in these areas and while the FEMA is dealing with the immediate impacts, they're looking a little bit at more the long-term work that could be done so that when it when and if there's another disaster, the community is ready. So all I can tell you is, you know, it's, nothing's perfect, and I'm sure there are examples that we have that aren't as good as the ones I mentioned. I'm sure there are, because nothing's perfect and nobody's perfect. But this is a very good program, time-tested, signed into law by Democratic presidents, Republican presidents, Last time passed here by unanimous consent, voted out of the committee, which I'm privileged to chair, with almost unanimous consent. We had one dissenter, um, and that's fine. We hope that we will win over that dissenter, but here's where we are. We have a chance to reauthorize this program. There are reforms we've made. I'm going to share with you some of the reforms we've made. You know, this can go on without an authorization and, and uh, stumble around. But what, what's important in this particular time, when the main three issues on people's minds are jobs, jobs, and jobs, we got to do a jobs bill. Um, you know, this, this is a jobs bill. 
This creates jobs at very low cost to the federal government. This creates jobs in private sector, in some of our cities, uh, and public works areas. So this is what we did in order to help people understand why we think it's important to reauthorize. Working with my ranking member, Senator Inhofe, we came up with some good reforms. We changed the current cost sharing requirements, so we increased the federal share for areas in which unemployment is especially high and per capita income is especially low, because we want to make sure that uh, when we go into an area that's deeply in need, we do a little more for them. We require additional planning assistance if overall funding levels increase. In other words, we want to keep our eye on these uh, projects. We want to make sure that they're meeting their goals. We modify the existing revolving loan fund program to allow recipients to convert an existing revolving loan fund to carry out another EDA eligible project so that we take the bureaucracy and say, look, if they have a better idea, let's go forward and let them use those funds in that way. We modify rules to allow recipients of grants that are more than 10 years old to buy out the federal government's interest at a depreciated rate. In other words, if a state, city, county uh, participant says, you know what, we want to do this on our own. This is an older grant and we feel we want to take it over. They can buy out the federal government's interest. We emphasize that EDA should work with its federal, state, and local agencies partners to support economic and workforce development strategy. And Senator Inhofe mentioned his reform that he made sure happened, which is that we're not duplicating other programs. That's important. We, want, we don't want to be duplicative. We want to be sure that what we're doing is not being done elsewhere. And we walk in and we frankly do something that people need now. We create jobs and we leverage. That word leverage has become the first word out of my mouth when I talk about things that I support now. That's why I support the highway bill that we hope is going to come here in a bipartisan way. We leverage dollars. Anytime you can leverage dollars, you put a dollar down for something good and people come to the table from local government, nonprofit sector, profit sector, state, all the different agencies, all the different parties come together and say, this is a great idea. If we all kick in just a little, we're going to do something big. And that's the idea behind the EDA. And uh, I visited uh, projects in my own state, shopping malls, other things that were done uh, in these very difficult communities where it's tough to get capital, where the banks just turn their back, where Perhaps the venture capitalists are saying, well, this isn't our cup of tea. So that's why this is a, su a successful program. So again, I hope that we'll have debate today on the Tester-Corker Amendment. It's a very controversial one. Uh, it's, it's not happy because, you know, it's one of these things where you do one thing, 50% of the people think you're right. You do the other. 50% think you're wrong, although Senator Durbin says the polls show that people support these lower fees in this case. But I respect the fact that, that the, uh, the amendment was offered on this bill. It is a, an amendment that is directly related to our economy. But I hope we vote tomorrow as early as possible, and I hope that we don't have a lot of amendments dragging us down, because guess what? People are looking at us and they're thinking, why aren't they doing more to create jobs? And this will send a signal that we are making the EDA a priority. This is not a big spending measure. This is an authorization. And the number we're authorizing at has been frozen. So we're not adding to it. But we are sending a signal to the appropriators and to the Commerce Department that we think this is a good and important program. Mr. President, I thank you very much. And I've said my piece for the uh, note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.